In this video, we are going to discuss a normal distribution and how to calculate probabilities and percentiles for that in R. Also, how to do um, random number generation, though, in other words, a simulation. So the scenario we're going to look at is discussed in your textbook. It deals with platelet volumes, and these platelet volumes are normally distributed with a mean of 8.75 and a standard deviation of 0.75. Now, before we continue with this example, we are not going to discuss the t, f, and chi-square distribution functions, but you'll see when you draw those yourself that they work exactly the same as this function, or these functions that we're going to look at. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to create two variables, mu and sigma, because I'm going to use them repeatedly. So in coding, it's good uh, practice when you're going to use something repeatedly not to enter that value every single time but rather store it in a variable and then refer to it so I'm just going to call it mu and make mu 8.75 and then I'm going to do sigma as well and that is 0 0.75 so if I run this code then we can see that those two values have been stored for me. So now instead of having to type them every single time, I can go and refer to them. And the, the good thing about this is if I, for instance, want to go and try this with a different value of mu or a different value of sigma, I only need to change it here in one place instead of having to go change it everywhere. Now, our first question is calculating a probability. So before we can do that, let's actually just go and look at this function that we're going to use. So the function that we're interested in is um, the p norm function. So I'm just going to type question mark p norm in my console and you can see immediately it gives me some information here on the right hand side. So you can see there's a denorm function, a p norm function, a q norm function, an r norm. D norm we generally won't be working with too much. Um, there might be a case where we will. Um, and then there's p norm, q norm, and r norm, which we'll use a lot more often. And like I mentioned, for the other distributions, the functions are very similar. So you can Google it or you can take a guess and see what comes up. Um, I, I think most of them are quite easy to guess what the function name is going to be. Now, if we look at the information here, you can see that the syntax um, is quite similar for all of these functions. Um, R norm is a bit different from P norm and Q norm. Here it's just with P norm, you enter a Q value and with Q norm a P value. And then you also have to enter mean standard deviation. So it's showing you here that if we don't enter the mean and the standard deviation, it's by default going to be zero and one. In other words, a standard normal distribution. Um, so if, if you are working with standard normal, you don't need to specify that mean and standard deviation. For every other normal distribution, you need to go and specify that. There's also a lower tail function, which we can specify. By default, you can see it's true. And if we want to calculate something which is not lower tail, we would then just change it to false. And that log p, we don't need to worry about. So here we can see then um, the x and the q values, x is of course for d norm, um, are vectors of quantiles and p is a vector of probabilities or if you want a single value. So you can enter a vector of values or you can enter just a single value. That would be fine as well. Now let's look at the first question. So we want to calculate the probability that x is less than 7.52 and assign that to prob1. So let's start with the assignment. So we have prob1 and into that is we are going to assign our answer to that question. So since we want a probability, we're going to use the p norm function. So it's p norm. And then our quantile in this case is that 7.52 that we are interested in. Then we need to tell it what the mean is. So I'm just going to type mu here and we can type sigma next. And you can see it's already predicting, so I don't even have to type the whole word. I'm just going to press tab on my keyboard. I know it was one letter away, but often we'll, we'll have a little bit more to type. So if we run this code, it is assigned in here and you can already see your answer appearing here in your environment.
Um, you could, of course, use that trick that we had last week and just put everything in um, round brackets. And if we run that code, it will be displayed in our console. So either way, whatever works for you is perfect. Now, calculating the 85th percentile, obviously we're not going to use the pnorm function. We are going to use qnorm because now it's no longer probability. We want a quantile in this case or a percentile. So this one I'm going to assign to P85, just so it's a little bit more descriptive. And to do that, we are going to use, like I said, the QNorm function. It auto predicts, so I can just press tab and it adds in all my brackets and everything for me. And the quantile I want is going to be 0.85. So let's actually just first enter it as 85 because you might be wondering how I know to put it as a 0 0.85, and let's see what happens. So I'm going to just tell it I have mu, and I have um, a standard deviation sigma, and I'm going to press enter here again. And you can see here, I'm getting an error message. So often it doesn't specify here that um, it should be a value between 0 and 1, Sometimes the, the documentation will tell us that, sometimes it won't. Let's just see if we scroll down a little bit more if it's given anywhere else. I haven't actually checked that before. Um, there we go. Let's see, uses of the function. They are not showing that, unfortunately, but it's always good to check. So just a hint from experience, if you run into this type of error, and I think it's similar in um, Excel as well, you always want this quantile here to be between zero and one. So that's just a little bit of a hint. So if we run this now, again, you can see that P85 has been created and it has a value that makes logical sense. And what I mean by it makes logical sense is we have our 85th percentile that we're interested in. We know the 85th percentile just means that 85% of my values in that distribution should be less or equal to that percentile and that means that it's going to lie to the right of my mean and we can see when we compare these values that mu is smaller than p85 so always do these small checks just to think whether your answer makes sense also same thing here if we looked at our probability in the previous question we expect a probability which is smaller than 0 0.5 because this value 7.52 is smaller than our mean and we wanted the probability of getting something less than that value so we know that area to the left of 7.52 has to be smaller than the area to the left of 8.75 so always think remember a computer only does what you tell it it doesn't think for itself so if there's a mistake not the computer's mistake it's your mistake so always think if your answers are making sense now, the next thing we may want to do is a simulation. So that's where the rnorm function is going to come in. And you can see this is quite a simple function. It just has three arguments, n, the mean, and the standard deviation. And we can see here, n is the number of observations that we want to generate. So first thing we're going to do is set a seed value. And a seed value just means that if I do this with this, uh, a, a specific seed value and you guys do it at home with the same seed value, you should get exactly the same answer. If you um, do it with a different seed value, you'll get a different answer from what I'm getting. And if I do this again with the same seed value, then I'm going to get the same answer yet again. So it means that we can replicate what we've done. Um, and that's why it's important to set the seed value. If we want it completely random, we wouldn't set a seed value. But obviously, even with this being not quite random in the sense that we can replicate it, it's still random to us because we don't know what the results are going to be. So I just picked the seed value of 407 and I'm going to run my code. And you'll see that nothing was created here in the environment. But something did happen. You can see that in the console. Now we want to generate a random sample. So I'm going to use my, or I'm going to sign it into SOMP. I'm not going to use sample because you can see that's the name of a function. So we never want to call a variable or an object the same thing as one of our 
uh, functions in R. I'm just going to call it SOM and I'm going to use the R norm function because I want to generate from a random distribution, uh, a normal distribution. And let's say I want to generate 500 values with a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma. So if I run this, and I'm not going to display the results here immediately, you can see here that I have 500 values and those are the first few ones. So if you just want to display the first few values, there's a head function and you can go and say, okay, I want the head of SOMP. And if I run that, it will display the first six values to me. So that's a nice function to use as well. You can, all, of course, also um, display it using the subset functions we learned last time. Um, but this is just a quick way of doing it. Or you can view the whole data set if you're interested. Now, I want to also just show you what happens if I rerun this code. And I then again display this first bit you'll see that now it's different. And that's because I have reset my, or I've continued on from that seed value. So I'm no longer using the 407. It's taken the first sample and after setting the seed value to 407, and then it kind of moves on to a next point. So the next sample won't be exactly the same. So that's why it's important if you want to rerun this code to always run the set seed bit as well again. So if I run that again, you can see that. And if I do that whole head thing, then you can see I'm back to my first sample. So let's just move this up a little bit and you can see we're back to the same results that we got before. Now, next we might want to look at the mean and the standard deviation of the sample. So we've generated a single sample and I, if I want the mean for this, it's obviously going to be X bar because it's a sample mean. So I'm just going to calculate the mean of my sample data. And if I want to calculate my standard deviation, that's just S because it's sample standard deviation. Remember the sample standard deviation, this SD function, just a little throwback to your previous practical. If we looked up the SD function, and we scroll down and read the information here, you can see it says like the variance function, this uses the denominator n minus one. So it's a sample standard deviation. So always keep in mind, if you have population data that you're dealing with, it doesn't happen all too often, but let's say it does happen, then you would have to make adjustments because this function will not give you the population standard deviation. So there we go, we can add that in and we can run that code. And you can see that we've calculated S and X bar, both now appear in our environment. Then again, we can do a probability plot. I'm not going to go through that again. We did do that in the first practical, so feel free to revise that. So I'm going to move on to histograms. So let's say we want to do a histogram of the sample. Then there's a hist function. We can again go and look up the hist function and see what it does. And there we go. And you can see all the different arguments that are in there. So X is the vector of the values. Then you have your breaks, which it explains how it does them. You guys can go and read this. It uses pretty values apparently. And we can just stick with that. Um, you can also specify these if you really wanted to, but I think for our purposes, let's just stick to the default breaks. And then there's a few other uh, functions that we or arguments that we can use in here as well. So you'll recognize the main and the X lab and the Y lab. Um, there's also limits if you wanted to set the limits with, um, within it, which it should um, set up this graph, you can do that. So there's a lot of things that you can go and edit in here. So let's just stick to the basics. So if I run this code, I'm going to just run this on the sample, then you can see I immediately get my histogram, but this is not a very nice looking histogram and we never want to um, submit a graph that is not complete. So always think of your graphs. You need to submit a final product for evaluation so it needs to look professional. So what doesn't look professional here, we're f I'm fine with the, the heading on the Y axis, the frequencies, that's not a problem, but the SOMP tells us nothing. And 
this title really doesn't tell us much either. So we're going to go and edit those. So our heading, like we saw last time, we use the main argument. And I'm going to make my heading distribution of 500 simulated platelet volumes. So I'm going back to my original problem, which I wrote up here, so that we can understand, firstly, it's simulated data, and secondly, what is simulated. Then we can also go and edit this X label. So that is just going to be the X label one, um, the argument there. And the X label, we always have to think about what we are representing. So those are the original values of the observations, and those represent my platelet volumes. So that is what I'm going to put in here. So if I run this, I now have a much more professional looking graph. So if we knew what the platelet volume was, um, let's say it's cubic centimeters or cubic millimeters or whatever it was, um, or just milli milliliters, it's then we would add that obviously in as well. That wasn't given in the problem. Um, so we're not going to worry too much about it here. But just always keep in mind, if you know the units, you would also want to add that in.